Okay, next we have uh, Kate Luttrell from Yale University continuing on our SHADS theme. Hello everyone, thank you so much for coming. I'm a PhD student in David Post lab, and today I'm gonna be talking about some of my dissertation research, which I like to think of as opportunistically using river restoration projects to study questions in ecology and evolutionary biology. So a brief overview of where we're going today I'm going to talk a bit about secondary contact, introduce our study system, and then go over three of my dissertation projects in 20 minutes. Um, because of that, I'm going to graze over the methods a bit, so please come find me if you'd like more information on any of those projects. And finally, I'm going to attempt to wrap this up uh, all together, synthesize some data, and tell you what this means for alewife and what this, uh, how this could impact conservation and management of these fish. So as we all know, anadromous fish are in decline, and in an effort to get stocks back up and running, we are installing fish passage, uh, dune fish passage projects, installing dams, or not installing dams, taking out dams, installing fish ways, um, in an attempt to give these fish access to their historical spawning sites. What this is doing is increasing habitat connectivity, um, connectivity which will increase the probability that previously isolated populations will come into contact again and this is an event known as secondary contact. And secondary contact, which I'm gonna explain in the next slide, can have some really complex uh, ecological <coughs> and evolutionary consequences for fish populations. So what the heck is secondary contact and why do we care about it? So secondary contact occurs uh, when you have a population that's divided, so in our case that might be a dam, splitting up a fish population. <laughs> Each population is gonna experience different selection pressures, they may evolve, become very divergent. And when those populations come back together again, in our case, we have a fish installation. Um, depending on the degree of divergence between those populations, the ecological and evolutionary process, processes that happen here can have long-term evolutionary consequences. So you can get things like the speciation uh, of those populations. They may just fuse again if there's a lot of gene flow. You can also get the development of a hybrid zone. So this seems a little bit, um, a lot of theory about ecology and evolution, but I think this may be relevant um, depending on your management goals for a given population. Now, alewife are a fantastic system to study secondary contact. The reason is we know, well, one, they have an alternate life history form, the landlocked form, which I don't think we talk about a lot in fishery science. They live their entire life in fresh water. We also know quite a bit about their evolutionary history and the ecological differences between them. So David Post and his lab have done a lot of work, as has Eric Schultz at UConn. The big differences are here in our adults. This is an anadromous fish and a landlocked fish. Is they are much, much smaller. They have smaller gape width and gill rakers, so foraging morphology is smaller. They're also not great at osmoregulating. They can't tolerate full seawater, and they also have a reduced swimming ability. Now the ecological effects um, of alewife on zooplankton are sort of famous and well known. And I kind of summarize this in a little diagram. So anadromous fish, when they're born as young of the year, enter um, a system in freshwater lakes, right, with abundant zooplankton. Their large body zooplankton is like a buffet. They rapidly consume this, and by fall, there's nothing left. So they bail, um, they go out to the ocean, <laughs> only to come back again when they're spawning. Now landlocked fish, in contrast, they are constantly in the lake. So they're always grazing on zooplankton. They maintain a population of small body zooplankton in a lower abundance. And what this has done over time has led to an eco-evolutionary feedback. So zooplankton um, are constantly grazed by alewife. They have a smaller body size. And this in turn feeds back to put a selection pressure on the <coughs> alewife for smaller foraging morphology. So this can lead to rapid evolution. Now the differences between these two types of alewife sort of sets up some really interesting <coughs> potential for secondary contact once these fish meet. Historically, Nadris and landlocked alewife have been isolated, but a recent fishway installation at Rogers Lake in Old Lyme, Connecticut, um, and here's the Connecticut River and Long Island Sound for reference, is bringing these fish into contact for the first time in centuries. So Rogers Lake was dammed in 1672, and it did lead to the evolution of a landlocked alewife population. The fishway was opened in 2015. And we've been stocking alewife um, since then from both the Mill Brook which is connected to Rogers. Unfortunately, the run is dwindling there. So we've been supplementing from fish from Bride, which is one of the biggest, or if not the biggest run in Connecticut. And every single one of those fish is handled. So every adult fish going into Rogers, we know the size, their sex, and we're taking genetic samples from all of those fish. 
So going into this as a young grad student, um, I had two predictions about what would happen when these two fish populations are now interacting. One is that anadromous and landlocked aliens might hybridize. From the literature, we know landlocked fish spawn a little later, but they kind of overlap a bit. Um, and two, I predict predicted from an uh, ecological sort of perspective that landlocked airwaves might outcompete anadromous airwaves for zooplankton. So landlocked airwaves have that smaller gill raker uh, rakers and foraging morphology, so they may have a home field advantage, if you will, in their lake over anadromous airwaves. So first question, will anadromous and landlocked airwaves hybridize? To get at this question uh, before secondary contact even occurring in Rogers, we essentially constructed spawning time probability distributions from otoliths, so we back calculated spawning date from the end of the year. Uh, we used two anadromous and three landlocked weights. And we needed a metric for measuring hybridization potential. So I did that in two ways. One was a spawning overlap. So that's very simply the proportion or percentage of the landlocked population that spawns within some time period within the anadromous spawning period. And then more conservative, we had intervening events. So this is the probability that on any given day, one anadromous and one landlocked fish are spawning at the same time. And we added this up throughout um, the entire spawning season and converted that to a percentage of the landlocked population experiencing those events. So it's a much more conservative estimate. So here's the data. This was published last year. So if you're interested in um, either the details of this or if you want to use these models, we do have the code available for you on GitHub. Takeaway here is that anadromous alewife in blue spawn earlier and over a shorter duration than landlocked alewife in red. Rogers here is this orange one, and this is another population, Patagansit. And as you can see, um, in addition to spawning later, there's also a bit more variation between populations and from year to year in our landmark populations. The overlap was pretty low, it's about 3 to 13 percent. However, if you look at not necessarily models with the actual data, especially Patagansit down here, it could be as high as a 30% overlap, which is significant potential for hybridization. However, the interbreeding events is only 0.1 to 0.4%. So again, these are pretty conservative estimates and we're not factored in th things like fish behavior. So the next question is, well, did they actually hybridize? And we did collect genetics data. Um, so this, this is the sampling numbers from um, the adults that we are stocking into Rogers every year. So about, up to about 3,000 fish a year that we're getting genetics data from. For the young of the year, in August we sample, and we try to get about 1,500 fish per year. Um, so this next slide, this is a work that was done by our collaborators at UC Santa Cruz, Carrie Reed from Eric Palkovax's lab. Unfortunately, we had a bit of a glitch, um, but the takeaway here is that of 1,400 young of the year that were sampled in 2017, 6.5% were pure anadromous, so we did have successful spawning of anadromous fish. 2% were F1 hybrids, and really cool, 2.5% were back crosses. So in addition to having your <coughs> F1 hybrids, fish were then back, these hybrids were back crossing with the land landlocked fish. Um, this plot here, we had a glitch, but this is just showing that we had really great distinction between those genetic groups. So in summary, we did have some pre isolation. They spawn a little bit different time, but there's overlap, and the variation in that overlap is driven by variation in landlocked airway spawning behavior. And that, you know, the overlap was about 3 to 13 percent, but like I mentioned, fish behavior could increase this. So, for example, if you're a landlocked fish, particularly a male, and you see these big, ripe, beautiful anadromous females coming into that system, <laughs> they may be encouraged to spawn earlier, which could move the entire spawning distribution earlier. So, that's also something that we've considered. And conveniently, we've got about 4.5% um, of hybrids in the young of the year in 2017, which falls beautifully within our prediction for hybridization. <laughs> How often does that happen? <laughs> All right, so now moving on to the other parts of my dissertation, more about the ecology. One thing I was thinking about was how will anadromous young of the year grow in a prey environment structured by landlocked alewife? So remember, landlocked alewife have foraging morphology that's adapted to eating small body zooplankton, whereas anadromous do not. Um, and I'm really interested in growth because, as we all know, growth plays an important role in determining like, when you reach key life history traits, such as fecundity, size, and maturity, um, it can impact your survivorship. And all of these things also play a role in ecological interactions such as competition. <coughs> so to look at this, we did a mesocosm experiment looking at zooplankton size, so large body, and low uh, zooplankton abundance, so high abundance of zooplankton. This is a continuous buffet of food for these fish. And then a shortage of prey, so that was about four times less uh, zooplankton biomass. 
And these extremes here, so high large represents an anadromous lake, and low small represents what you see in a landlocked lake. So this is what we did, so we did these little cattle tank mesocosms. The fish were fed a set amount of zooplankton each day, so control, controlling for biomass and our sampling effort. We towed for hand for zooplankton, and I did get carpal tunnel from <laughs> doing that every day. Um, and we individually marked every single fish, so we have individual level data, and this is the last of our tags. This experiment ran for two weeks. It was a short experiment. We collected different growth uh, parameters, so it was an RNA DNA ratio, was weight, length from marked otoliths. So this is a, a lizard in red marking. And to summarize the results, the only thing that was really important here was weight. Um, and oddly, so if you look, so I put the little zooplankton here so you can see this, the different treatments. Anadromous is A, landlocks is L. They kind of behave the same way with respect to zooplankton size. So landlocked alewife did not do better than anadromous alewife on small body zooplankton, which kind of contradicts what we've been thinking about alewife evolution, right? We would have predicted that landlocked fish might have had an advantage here. They did not. What was significant is if you look, there was an interaction effect between zooplankton abundance and your life history form. So if you look here, anadromous fish kind of had it through more when there was abundant food, but they had they did worse than landlocked alewife when food was scarce. So the relationship between those lines flip-flopped. So I kind of think of it as the magnitude of the difference between those two lines. Anadromous alewife kind of boom bust, like they do really well when there's food, but they can also do really bad when food is scarce. Landlocked alewife, they don't do much. They kind of hover right around zero. They grow a little bit, but they don't lose as much weight. So I think of them as conservers. So the next step is to put these fish into direct competition, right? So now factoring in fish behavior. And we did this with um, in-lake mesocosm, so big mesocosm bags. And this is sort of our experimental design here. We had 16 bags, and we had low density, so four fish, versus a high density or high competition, 12 fish. And then to look at competition among and between the different life history forms, we also varied the proportion of landlocked alewives. So we went from zero, all anadromous fish, all the way up to 100%, so all landlocked fish. And these are our cousins, Ray and Rogers, so we did this in the lake that the fish are experiencing secondary contact. These bags were set up about a month in advance to let the zooplankton community develop. Um, here's another picture, so you can see this about, um, not a person wide, it's about six feet wide. And they're very deep, maybe three, four times that deep. We did not supplement zooplankton. It was literally a fish hunger games. So we ran this <laughs> for a month. Uh, we had individually marked fish again, and we collected a lot more data. <clears throat> Things like zooplankton community structure. So we sampled zooplankton every couple days, diets, um, mortality rates, and a bunch of different growth parameters. The only thing I have data for right now is weight. And I'm going to highlight some things so you can see this better. So looking at the proportion, we have 100% anadromous fish on the left moving. Here's the 50-50 mark here, to 100% landlocked on the right. And these are the density treatments. So again, I've labeled anadromous and landlocked with letters so you can see the movement better. Um, and here's low density, so it makes sense that within a life history form, you do better when there's less of you, right? There's more food available. What was really interesting to me was that anadromous alewife, even at high densities, grew better than landlocked alewife in either treatment. So 12 anadromous fish, or 12 fish, they grew better than four landlocked fish which is sort of stunning. And the other thing that I thought was really interesting here, uh, again, we kind of see this boom bust. There's a bigger difference between the anadromous lines and the landlocked lines. Landlocked don't do much. Um, and there's also this increase in growth rate with less anadromous fish. So if you're an anadromous fish and there's less anadromous fish and more landlocked, it seems like they have higher growth. So competition between anadromous fish is fierce. And not so much with landlocked, although if you look at the high density of landlocked, the more anadromous fish you have, they do a little bit worse. They actually started losing weight. So to summarize all of that, I know I threw a lot at you. Um, for prezygotic isolation, we did detect some isolation, but there was potential for these fish to hybridize, uh, about 3 to 13 percent. And we did find hybrids in 2017. We also found some hybrids in 2018, but it was less. So this sort of matches up with what we were saying about there being a lot of variability year to year. For growth, anadromous alewives have a huge growth potential and they're a little bit boom bust. So they respond great when their food is abundant, but they respond a little bit worse when food is scarce. Landlocked fish don't do much. They kind of stay around the same way. Uh, so the magnitude of the difference isn't as great. And for competition, anadromous alewives seem to uh, 
seem to alpacate or grow better than landlocked fish, although I'm not sure if this is a reflection of intrinsic growth rates or actual competition. Um, another thing to consider, something we observed the anadromous fish doing was using a private resource, a niche partition, in the mesocosm bags. So what anadromous fish do in the wild with young of the year, they prefer pelagic prey, but when that is depleted, they will move inshore and use eat benthic zooplankton. Landlocked fish don't do this, and this, we think it might be their inability to eat below their eye level, so they actually can't forage like that. So we actually saw anadromous fish picking zooplankton off the sides of the bag, so we may have had a private resource even within these mesocosms. So I'm really excited to see the diet data as well as the stable isotopes, which should pick that up for us. So what does this mean for Rogers? So secondary contact and the outcomes of that really depends on gene flow and ecological interactions. For example, if you have really weak gene flow, so no gene flow, and really strong ecological interactions that push those populations apart so they're competing strongly, that sets up the opportunity for something like speciation. As opposed to having a lot of gene flow and maybe really weak ecological interactions, that's where you might get a case where the population is fused back together into one population. For Rogers, we have some gene flow, and that might increase as we start um, getting the run up and going again, they may just swap out landlocked their life. We're not sure what's gonna happen there. As for ecological interactions, it's hard to say. So it looks like anadromous fish are really strong competitors. They grow really fast, but they also have this ability to use a private resource. So what we may see is not so much competition, but the shift in habitat use. And I think we need some more long-term data to draw complete conclusions, um, but I think we can say a bit about how this could impact our thoughts about management of anadromous fish species. So if we think about hybridization, um, it could have some negative consequences, right? So these landlocked fish, they have lost the ability to migrate to sea. They're weak at osmoregulating, regulating they don't tolerate seawater, and they're weak swimmers and they're smaller. So you can imagine if hybrids are smaller, they can't osmoregulate, regulate um, they may not be able to migrate to sea at all. And this could have some detrimental consequences depending on the species and the populations you're considering. Two, we have consequences of competition. Um, if there is fierce competition, you can get fish that are smaller. They might migrate earlier at a smaller size.